Welcome to this third edition of our French German Leadership Discourse Series. This series is led by my colleague Philippe Meissner, is Professor of Strategy and is the director of our European Center for Digital Competitiveness. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, let me remind you of the founding principle of this series. We want to emphasize leadership. First, the leadership shared by France and Germany throughout the years, especially during the hardship of uh, the pandemic. Second, we want to emphasize thought leadership through values such as democracy, freedom, human rights. As the first business school founded in France and now rooted in Europe, namely in Germany as we are today on our Berlin campus, we're proud to continue to develop uh, generations of business leaders and we hope they will carry this value forth. And to further inspire uh, our student participants uh, being with us this morning, I have the immense pleasure to welcome Thomas Bubel, CEO of AXA. And we will have a dialogue about leadership under, in times of crisis. And uh, we hope we get uh, um, further insights in how he and his company uh, navigated uh, um, turbulent waters and uh, how they built resilience. So with no further ado, welcome Mr. Bubel. Um, how we will proceed, we will have a, a dialogue together with a series of, of questions um, around these, these topics and at about the halfway mark, we will welcome questions from our, from our audience. So uh, my, my first questions uh, to you will be, well, um, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yes, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here today. It's a great pleasure and certainly the French-German uh, uh, collaboration is uh, an extremely important one and very close to my heart because uh, my background is a true European background. I mean, I was born in Germany, lived in Switzerland for a long time and now I live in France. Um, I have uh, really benefited uh, as well during my studies from uh, studying uh, in all the countries and also in the US and I have to say uh, this is extremely important and has shaped me as well as uh, uh, being above a country and looking at it uh, from a European perspective. And I think uh, I would uh, really like to encourage uh, all your students uh, to make sure that uh, they consider that as well, uh, making sure that they open their perspectives and they look beyond their own country. Very good. Indeed, we are very much emphasizes intercultural management and diversity and inclusion. So, yes, thank you for this for this inspiring message. What were the pivot points in your in your career? It started with a few failures because uh, I wanted to become uh, an organist and um, I, I went quite far, but then uh, had to uh, give up because I can't sing. So this was the end of my first career and uh, this uh, repeated itself again uh, until uh, I found what uh, I do today, which is insurance. And many people said to me at the time, look, um, why are you interested in this business? Because it's more you know, of a bureaucratic business and a business that uh, is more traditional. Yes, that's true, but the business is very much in the middle of society. When you think about an insurer uh, as uh, an institution to help a society to diversify risk, uh, to help a society to overcome uh, social fragmentation on the one hand, and on the other hand to also make sure that uh, the investments an insurer does, because we are also a big investor, leads uh, into the right avenues, and certainly I'm sure we'll talk about it later, the whole climate transition uh, is now at the heart of this debate. Um, I'm very pleased to have found a, uh, a profession that really inspires me and in which I can do good for society uh, on a very large scale. Very good, very good. I, I am pleased to hear that because it, it, we seem to share with, with the business school, the SCP, uh, some, some of those common um, sense-making uh, principle. And that's what we try to also um, share with our students that yes, we have to do business and we have to make profitable business, but we also have to have some sense around it. So thank you for that perspective. Now, getting more um, to the points of your leadership, um, maybe you, you characterize your leadership style, but also what were your leadership challenges, namely over the past year? 
I would even go a little bit further because COVID was only one episode. I mean, uh, we had, I would say there were three in total. Uh, one was in 2016, my integration uh, into France because I, meet, I had a remote uh, knowledge of French. Uh, I knew maybe four people. And so I had to start from zero, uh, integrating into a society that I didn't know, a society that uh, have their own uh, codes, uh, a society that uh, you know uh, can survive without me. And so um, making sure that uh, you fully integrate, that French becomes your daily language, so they speak more French than English and German. And uh, to really integrate was, I think, the first challenge. And uh, this is something that uh, continues. It's not done, it's never done. The second one was at the same time uh, I took over a company which was extremely well managed, um, very successful, mm -hmm. but uh, we had significant challenges around the question of climate, around the questions of low interest rates, and so uh, we had to shift with my team the company in a significant way. Uh, just to give an example, when I started we had 80% of our exposure in life insurance. And 80% in life insurance with interest rates that are so low, that's not a very uh, you know, uh, attractive proposition for the future. So we shifted the business from 80% life insurance to 20% life insurance, keeping the same uh, revenue of 100 billion. And so this is not, uh, was, was also a very difficult challenge. And then lastly, uh, was obviously COVID. We were all surprised by it. Um, we had to really uh, get in our boots uh, and, 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 and manage much more um, emotional uh, situations as well that we haven't seen beforehand. And so I would say those were my three challenges, not only last year, but uh, going a little further back. Uh, yeah. Of course, of course. Um, but that's, that's also... Uh, 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 lessons, deep lessons learned because we, we come and we, we have a certain leadership style and then a crisis hits and sometimes, uh, yeah, are we able with the same style or with the same ideas to, to navigate through? But yes, uh, so that's also probably the, the test, you know, <laughs> the, for, for all of us. Um, so indeed, um, getting a bit more precise into the, uh, the COVID disruption um, and you mentioned the emotional probably roller coaster everyone went through uh, throughout the world, but at AXA particularly, how do you think um, uh, you manage, you as a person, um, to build this resilience we're talking about? But do you think that your teams or your organization was, were also able to, to build some resilience? So the context was very particular for us on the emotional side. I mean, you have on the one hand uh, uh, our employees and obviously there were some very tragic stories um, of people having died uh, that were our employees. I, I even had one of my board members that died of COVID, which was uh, a very tragic moment. You had the second question, which was, um, how do you deal uh, with all the uh, customers uh, that uh, have been hit by COVID? I mean, we have 100 million customers, so um, these were very exceptional situations. And then you had uh, a third uh, leg, which was the whole question around reputation. We had, in particular, on the restaurant owner's front, uh, uh, a uh, significant uh, challenge in the media to deal with. Um, and uh, I even had to deal with it again this morning in France um, because it's still not over. And so uh, those were the three challenges. How did we deal with it? Um, obviously, on the employee side, we made sure that very quickly uh, we could bring uh, our employees in a safe space. Um, we invested, luckily, very early on uh, in uh, ways of working remotely, and some countries already had those uh, you know, arrangements where you were three days in the office and two days somewhere else, so that was easy. And we, we could very quickly move our um, employees into uh, their home base. They could continue to work, interact with other uh, colleagues, but also could serve their customers. So there was no, uh, there was no uh, issue on that side. Then on the whole question around uh, how do you deal uh, with uh, you know, the reputation issues, this was certainly very difficult, very demanding, and uh, one had to also be courageous in some moments because if you've got uh, many politicians uh, and uh, many journalists against you, uh, it is not a very comfortable situation. And then uh, certainly there is also the element of uh, do you survive a crisis uh, and do you, uh, how strong are you from a business perspective and financially? And um, we were able to continue our business uh, completely. We actually sorted out of the crisis, came out of the crisis uh, stronger than we went into the crisis. So um, uh, 
we really uh, pushed on certain uh, elements of uh, cash management, solidity of the balance sheet, um, making sure that we pushed even more uh, uh, digital investments and so on. So all in all, when I look back uh, on myself, I mean, I think I have never worked uh, as much as I have there, and I think we can probably all say that. Um, I shifted my agenda very much away from uh, the daily, day-to-day -day business and looking after the business to looking after people. So um, I, for example, uh, made sure that uh, with all the CEOs, uh, I had uh, every six, every eight weeks an interaction where I just listened uh, and, and tried to help. And so, and I want to keep this. Uh, and certainly, uh, well, look, there was also one benefit of uh, the confinement. Uh, I have never seen my family that much, which was a great pleasure. Uh, having uh, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner with them. And so, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're, as a leader, uh, one has learned a lot, uh, one has changed, and uh, I really hope that we can keep, or that I can keep this up now. Yes, I, I agree with you, because we, we learn really valuable lessons, and also there are some positive aspects of this crisis. So, yes, we need to, to reinforce those. So, okay, I hear uh, best practices and, and um, getting stronger. And... Did you provide um, also, uh, what, what kind of support did you provide to your workforce? Well, okay, organizing home office, but were, were there any, as you were, yourself, you had to cater for your clients to, you know, to, to help them um, get through, but for your workforce, was, was there anything that you put in place in particular to support them? Yes, so I mean, number one, we helped all of them very quickly to get into a safe environment and to be able to continue to work. Secondly, uh, we made sure that uh, we did not do any social uh, changes during this time. So during the confinement, we said, look, uh, no uh, uh, changes. Nobody um, is, uh, you know, uh, has to be afraid of his or her job which was a very uh, uh, good message. And then thirdly, from very early on, we engaged a lot also in, 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 in social interactions and in societal interactions. So for example, uh, we founded research, we bought masks, uh, we helped uh, small and medium companies to be recapitalized and so on. So, and this was very reassuring for um, our employees that on the one hand, we are solid, but on the other hand, we are also taking a very large role in the rebuilding, uh, in the re relaunching of the economy. And um, I think, and then certainly now, we're coming to a phase uh, in which uh, we also see the uh, mental issues that that crisis uh, has left and will leave. And so we launched uh, a uh, dedicated program on mental health to help um, the people that are uh, confronted with this. And from very early on, we uh, were, I think, were the first ones in France to negotiate with uh, the uh, unions an agreement uh, in which, again, depending on the job profile, but in general, a model of three days in the office and two days somewhere else is the model that we are looking at going forward. Um, obviously, we now have to put it in place, which, uh, again, will not be easy because uh, you've got uh, to manage people coming back to the office, uh, feeling also safe in the office, and then later on balance uh, the this hybrid model in a way that uh, it works for everybody. Right. Yes, and now next I would like to have your perspective on, on Europe. And uh, this is how we started our discussion today together. Um, certainly French, German, but okay, the whole of Europe. And you said that you are, you know, a, a European um, person. So could you please um, tell us a bit more about your vision of Europe and how you think we can move forward? as a region, as an entity. No, Europe is very important for me because I grew up in Europe uh, and uh, it was great at the time not to use your passport anymore and travel everywhere. And this was very much uh, grown uh, under the uh, vision of uh, prosperity and peace. Today, uh, we've reached uh, a, uh, an, an era in which um, this prosperity and peace is somehow taken for granted. Uh, I believe it's an illusion because uh, on our boundaries you see uh, certainly on the east side uh, everything else but peace. And therefore I think it's important that we are reminding ourselves every day that uh, peace uh, is never accomplished unless you, unless you fight for it all the time. Secondly, we have I think a great opportunity um, when you look at the uh, macro and global scale. The debate is only about China and US. 
Europe somehow has disappeared off the radar. And I think it would be good to get us back on the radar in a way that we say, look, what is our model? Uh, what is a model that differentiates us mm -hmm. from the US and uh, from China? And certainly when you look, uh, to my mind, Europe has very strong values, very democratic values, and values that are based on, I would say, a responsible capitalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You will not find the same model, nor in the US, nor in China. Uh, because when you think back, uh, social systems were invented in Europe, um, mm -hmm. the whole climate debate started in Europe, mm -hmm. and I think there is a model uh, around uh, that to be built. And so going forward, uh, we all uh, need to um, work uh, on a common vision for Europe. Um, we need to have the right leaders, but I think it's not too late. Uh, what you see now is exactly that phase of orientation where we need to find ourselves again for this next phase. And so we all need to contribute uh, so that Europe of tomorrow becomes a, a success. Exactly. So when you mean we need the right leaders, um, everyone can be leader of this of this uh, endeavor, right? What you're saying is not just a political leader, but all yes. together, business, not, not can business be. schools should can be, or has ha to be, have has to, to be. be. <laughs> because I mean, look, yeah. the, the, the 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 tectonic plates uh, have changed, have shifted. Yes, I mean, um, right, right. Uh, when you look, everybody always puts the responsibility on politicians. Mm. Yes, they are responsible for this, yeah, but, but today it's much more balanced uh, between yeah. uh, many actors, and uh, so we all have our part in it. We all need to fight uh, for it, and uh, that's why this is a common message to all of us. Connecting business, society, and politician. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, well, perfect transition to, to my question on sustainability. So um, we, uh, as business school, made it one of our uh, core strategic goals. And we are actually now already um, uh, recognized as, as being at the forefront of, of these issues, uh, also in rankings. But I'm really interested to know um, uh, how AXA is, is dealing with it. Um, I've, I've looked at your integrated report and I see that you have set some very ambitious goals for, for, the, for the company regarding the climate, for example. Could you explain us a bit more about that? Yes, I mean, uh, insurance is, as I said earlier, in the heart of society. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. so from very early on, uh, we followed a path of how can we be uh, socially responsible within the business model. Um, I'm not a believer in a checkbook policy where you write your check and then you have done your duty. And so we've been uh, thinking about this a long time and also acting a long time uh, already. We were the first ones in 2015 mm -hmm. to get out of coal investments. And I remember at the time it was a revolution and uh, everybody thought we were crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, today I would say uh, this is uh, a uh, very common sense. And so uh, this, the beginning was very much to say, look, how can we from an investment side shift uh, the investments from the polluters to green? Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time we went out of coal, as I said, uh, invested 24 billion into green uh, energy. Mm -hmm. But when you look, do you really move the needle? The answer is no. Uh, you need to tackle what I would call the olive space, uh, uh, which is uh, the middle space. How do you uh, support the transition? Mm -hmm. How do you help um, with your investment, but also with your underwriting decisions to um, shift, for example, from oil to gas, from gas to hydrogen? And so this is the journey that we are currently on and uh, really supporting uh, the industry, uh, also in coalitions uh, with uh, the larger uh, financial uh, community to make sure that we are, on the one hand, uh, engaged in the thought leadership around this. So um, in the whole G7 uh, and okay. COP, um, uh, these companies play a large role. We play a large role, but also when it comes to uh, acting on it. And uh, for the first time last December, we have um, uh, issued a strategic plan in which one strategic priority is uh, our uh, climate goal. And the climate goal that uh, was mentioned there is how can we reduce our carbon footprint of uh, the balance sheet by 20% between 2020 and 2025, which is a significant amount okay. if you think about the size of the balance sheet. Yes, it is. But I recognize again the partnership ideas that, that you already developed for the European vision. So, yeah, business and society together. Well, on a little lighter topic now, um, I'd like to know uh, when you're not working, what is it? What is your favorite activity? Or maybe you have several favorite activities outside? 
I have a, a uh, let's say, very balanced private life. Um, and my favorite, I'll give you one, my favorite activity is horse riding. So um, I uh, go every week, uh, I go horse riding uh, in the forest of Romboyer, which is uh, close to yep. Paris. And uh, it's right. great to uh, reconnect uh, to nature. Uh, and uh, yeah, to spend time there and think and uh, experience the speed of the horse. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Um, well, at this point, um, we're ready to take some um, questions from the audience. So I will connect to a magic file here that should give me um, some questions. Um, hmm. Okay, the first question. So some may also be a bit uh, linked to, to our first uh, part, but that, that's good. That gives you the opportunity to give some more um, elements. So a first question uh, is um, asking, you talked about having a positive impact on a large scale. In which areas do you think AXA can have the biggest impact and how? So I spoke earlier about climate. Um, let's uh, enlarge a little bit. Um, we have uh, certainly launched in the middle of the crisis uh, our new uh, purpose, mm -hmm. which is um, uh, very much uh, around act uh, for human progress and protecting what matters. So you have uh, elements in there around protection, you have elements around uh, prosperity and development and elements around collectivity. And so when you think about where are the three areas uh, where this applies, climate is one of them, clearly. The other one is health. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been from very early on developing uh, as an, a large international health insurers, um, launching uh, services like telemedicine, which we also offered to the entire populations in entire countries during the crisis. Um, we had obviously a massive take up. And so this is a space where we'll continue. And then thirdly, uh, social inclusion. The question around uh, how can we make sure that uh, we are helping, uh, in particular uh, in developing countries, but also more and more uh, in Europe, to keep people out of poverty. Because um, uh, when you see insurance is a stabilizer. Take, for example, in India, we are very much focusing there on emerging customers and, and their need. And uh, often these are women entrepreneurs. Um, if they don't earn anything today, there's no bread on the table tomorrow. And so uh, to help these women in particular, to stabilize their life, to make sure that they can provide for the family uh, with very different and new products uh, is something that uh, we've uh, been pursuing a lot and uh, obviously uh, gives uh, a lot of, uh, you know, emotional reward when you see, uh, uh, when you see uh, that you can actually impact people's lives uh, and in particular women's lives uh, in, in these countries. Um, we had a couple of questions around this impact, but okay, so one uh, slightly related. Many investors such as uh, uh, Norwegian state funds uh, actively promote diversity in their boards. Um, so um, is this a priority that you also uh, see important um, for investors in general or for AXA in particular? Absolutely. So uh, if you look at our board of directors, uh, it's very diverse. Uh, and for me, diversity is not only male and female. This yeah. is one yeah. component. Uh, you have diversity around cultural diversity. Mm -hmm. You have diversity around, uh, you know, characters in a board. You have diversity around age as well. And so uh, we've tried uh, on, on the board uh, and succeeded as well on the board to uh, get a very good mix. If you then go into the uh, management teams, um, uh, we are on a journey. I mean, today in my team, we are at 30% if you look at male and female. Mm -hmm. But from a cultural perspective, um, the French uh, are not the dominant uh, nationality anymore. In my management committee, uh, we have very diverse figures uh, in there. And so we are working every day uh, through development uh, of, of, uh, of our talents uh, to really increase diversity. And when you look uh, at the ranks below the management committee, you see that we are roughly at 38% uh, of female, uh, females in leadership position, oh. again, with a very big spread around different nationalities. Very good, very good progress, because yes. yes. But All right. progress. We're progress, not exactly, progress. So, but so, yes, so you, you're actively... Uh, uh, promoting this through, throughout the ranks. All right. Um, 
a little bit of a different topic, but insurance business is facing enormous digital transformation. Um, what were the implications, you know, um, uh, at AXA, or, or, or did it have an implication on the leadership of AXA? So it's absolutely true, uh, and, and the, the digital challenge is in various places. I mean, it's uh, in one place where it's uh, simply the question, how can you offer uh, a better, simpler, more agile customer service? Because uh, traditionally, you receive a lot of paper from the insurer. It takes a long time. Mm -hmm. Today, if you take, for example, our Belgian uh, uh, subsidiary, 80% of the process are fully digital, and you can do everything by WhatsApp. And so um, we are moving very fast now into that space of how can we uh, uh, make the existing offer more digital. But I think that is more our housekeeping. The big question is, how is the uh, model of an insurer technologically disruptive and disrupted? And when you look from far away, what is an insurer? We are a payment institution of claims. We, you have a policy. Uh, if uh, you know a certain um, uh, you know event is triggered, you mm -hmm. pay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could automate that a lot, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so and, and for customers, paying just claims is not enough anymore. They are living in an environment in which, if you go back to health, mm -hmm. uh, health costs are exploding. They grow two, three times uh, the growth of the um, uh, of the uh, of the economy, mm -hmm. and so we they want more prevention. They want help of preventing the next claim, and you can only do that with digital services. I mentioned earlier telemedicine, but also on the uh, uh, commercial insurance space. Um, when you think about I IoT, satellite imaging. These are all areas uh, where we are now full speed developing uh, because our strategy is very much to shift our model from being a payer to a partner of the customer. Understood. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, AXA is an active investor. Uh, how does your knowledge of, of societal issues translate into your investment policy? Well, very much so. I mean, we're, we're looking, I mean, I, I mentioned uh, a couple example, examples earlier. Uh, we are looking very much at, uh, you know, what are the societal issues and uh, in particular also what are the societal risks. And so every uh, year we publish uh, the future risk report, which um, brings out uh, the 10 key risks. And if you look, uh, I mean, obviously last year the health risk was the key topic. Climate risks uh, is the second one and probably will go back to the first one again. You have the whole questions around to technological risks, uh, in particular cyber risks, cyber war, and you have the question of societal risks and fragmentation risks. And so those are for us the guiding principles of um, where and how do we need to invest uh, in order to accompany uh, a transition to a less risky world. Mm. All right, back to leadership. There are several questions around, around this idea. So first, um, um, what would you tell our young uh, generation of graduates uh, who are going to start to work um, in a few months? What, what would you tell them? What would you recommend to them? Let's say. I, I would recommend two things uh, when I look at myself. Uh, number one uh, is um, go and do the jobs that nobody else wants to do. Because at the age uh, of a student that just finished, your risk is zero. You can only gain, number one. Yeah. Number two, try and create a network around you uh, and also make sure that you um, uh, entertain the network yeah. with people you can exchange, with people that you can learn from, because um, many of our challenges uh, that we will uh, be seeing today and tomorrow Will, you cannot read in textbooks uh, of 20 or 30 years ago. You cannot even ask your predecessors because we are in times uh, where we are experiencing something that is new. And so the only way to master it is to pick bits and pieces from everywhere and make your own uh, recipe out of it. Uh, excellent advice. I, I totally adhere to that. Um, and so inspiration is, is very important. Also, the younger generation are telling us that they, they can't just have a command and control environment, but you, they need, again, the sense making. Um, so how do you think in your daily practice of leadership, are you inspiring uh, your, your, the members of your organization and, uh, and, um, and motivate them? How do you, 
I would say, how do you do it really, like day, day after day, not just on the big... Yeah, so I think what is very important is that you align yourself, uh, selves, and I mean the whole organization, around a common purpose, which mm -hmm. we did last year in the middle of the crisis. And mm -hmm. uh, so this gives a very clear um, uh, you know, reason uh, for existence uh, as well, mm -hmm. and also a reason to act. And then what you need to do is, um, in your daily action, mm -hmm. make sure that your decisions, uh, your uh, actions are very much aligned uh, with this purpose. And so, um, and you also demand this then from any everybody else, um, which means the demand is not a command control. It's very much a uh, way of making sure that you help people, that you support people to make the right choice. Um, and so that's why management style uh, has changed, will change even more. Mm -hmm. And um, it starts within yourself. Uh, if you are not fully aligned with a purpose, do not expect anybody else to be aligned with it. So you are the example, you lead, uh, and uh, you will show the way to the others. And you're quite accomplished now, but when you were younger, what were your models? What inspired you at some point? What, you know? What leadership model or do you have any people in mind that inspired you like a few years ago? And I mean, I, I have many people in mind, and that's why I, I've practiced. Uh, you know, I, I won't give you the Nelson Mandela, and uh, you know, because um, uh, exactly, they're the classics. <laughs> no, what I did, what I did. I mean, I came uh, into a leadership uh, position in in a bit of a strange way. Um, mm -hmm. In 2005, uh, I was still a consultant, a management consultant, um, running 10 people that were intrinsically motivated, and then the next day, I became head of distribution and marketing of a Swiss insurance company with 4,000 people, and I had no clue how to lead. So what I did uh, is uh, I uh, uh, spoke to a lot of people, and certainly people that were older, and asked them how they did it. And uh, I was inspired by them. And uh, you know, I, I picked many bits and pieces of little stories of how they've done it, and so uh, that's Again, uh, your own recipe. exactly yeah. my, you know, these were the <laughs> ingredients for my own recipe. Yeah. And uh, today I still do the same. So I, I speak to a lot of my colleagues, to a lot of people to understand what have they done. And in particular, learning from uh, others that are not in your own uh, sphere. So uh, sports people, musicians, uh, you know, they have the same challenges, but uh, they express it in a different way, they live it in a different way, and they are sometimes much more advanced. And so um, learning from others, uh, and those will inspire you, uh, has been my uh, journey. Great. And when you are um, recruiting young talents, or all kinds of talents, by the way, um, um, but future leaders of AXA, how, what are the key competencies you, you, I mean, it's in line with what you just said, but can you elaborate a bit on, on, on that? So I'm looking at people who, I'm actually looking at two things. One is, uh, can the person, and, and apart from the fact, does he or she understand the business, is there the, the necessary uh, level of intelligence? I leave that aside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, can this person work uh, in a team? Okay. And I don't mean hierarchical teams, but uh, you know, informal teams. And mm -hmm. secondly, is the person capable to reinvent him or herself? Mm -hmm. Because we come often to a point where we say to say, okay, look, what we decided three months ago or three years ago is not relevant anymore. Let's look at it new. Let's find a solution. Okay. And when you're very rigid uh, uh, and say, oh, we've done this always like this, and 20 years ago was the same, then you will not invent yourself uh, again. Very inspirational. Thank you. Um, Anna, I have some questions I think you addressed in the first part. So, um, about Europe, because I could even answer for you, but <laughs> uh, um, yeah, uh, our contribution to Europe of the Europe of tomorrow, you already addressed, in my opinion, but I don't know if uh, we want. So, somebody w wish to have that maybe uh, summarized again. And. Yeah, I can give you some concrete examples. Yeah. So I think w when, I, when I was younger, um, we had uh, many more initiatives around Europe. So I mean, there were uh, partnerships of towns. Uh, I went uh, to as an exchange student. Um, I benefited from uh, the Erasmus and so on. Uh, my feeling today is that uh, this is something that is only partially active. 
And mm. if we want uh, um, the new generation to feel as attached uh, to Europe as, uh, as you and I do, I think we need to revitalize that again. And so, for example, at the moment, um, uh, we are discussing in France uh, how can we make sure exactly. that we rebuild uh, uh, the young leaders, the young French-German leaders again, which, by the way, was also one of the outcomes mm -hmm. uh, that uh, President Macron and uh, Chancellor Merkel mm -hmm. decided on when they mm -hmm. had uh, the exactly. uh, uh, meeting uh, uh, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what can be done in Europe to have maybe more entrepreneurs or more startup or do we have enough maybe question one do we have enough or should we develop and if so how in your opinion so I mean I'm not so negative I think we have a lot we of a uh, entrepreneurs we have a lot of uh, good ideas um, the question is really how do these ideas come to fruition mm -hmm. and I think we need to more work on this mm -hmm. um, people are there ideas are there Uh, even the financing for the first, for the beginning, is often there. Mm -hmm. I think where it lacks uh, is the question around how do you scale up. So many businesses start great, but then uh, do not enter the scaling uh, phase. And uh, scaling phase because of two things. One, uh, obviously Europe is very fragmented, so your market is not uh, all of Europe, but often one state, and going across the border is not so easy. Different language, different culture, different regulation. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, the necessary funds to expand are often not provided. And um, again, this is something that is in our hands. Um, when you look at, uh, as an insurer, for example, we have very strict rules where to invest, where not to invest. Uh, this is great. I'm not criticizing this, but um, we are now coming to a point where you uh, have a massive challenge on climate investment, where you have significant challenge on um, getting new technologies, new, idea to the for new ideas to the forefront. And so shifting the allocation slightly towards more climate transition, more uh, uh, entrepreneurial activity is something that is in our hands and something that I would certainly strongly recommend. All right, and and being a little bit more flexible in our in our processes so that we can unlock funds is. Yes, but that goes with it. I mean, if, if once once you you are able to switch more uh, towards uh, you know the uh, the, la the the later phases of um, entrepreneurial development, okay. yeah. Um, yeah. once you do have uh, the ability to do it, I think it's it's, it's a matter okay. of uh, of time. Then and look, um, our investment teams are hungry to do it, and we've we've done it. I mean, when you look, uh, we've uh, built our own investment funds, AXA Venture Partners, which uh, has been very successful. Mm -hmm. We built our own incubator. We We invested uh, in uh, those companies also from our investment on the portfolio. So it is already happening, but I wish it could be much more. Precisely, what is uh, in your view the, the, or your vision of the future of insurance business in the next 10 years? What I'm saying to you now is might surprise you. Um, I think, so I said earlier, uh, An insurance company today is a uh, is a, an institution of payment of claims. Mm -hmm. I think in 10 years, an insurance company will be an orchestrator of communities that uh, have an aim of reducing their risk. Mm -hmm. And so how will this work? Today, the uh, payment of the claim is at the center of our activity. Tomorrow, the avoidance of the claim is at the center of activity. Mm -hmm. How do we uh, make sure that our model shifts to prevention? Uh, to avoid the claim. Going forward, uh, there is another element which we never looked at. I mean, the insurer can help you, can help uh, the cameraman to uh, uh, be better, but you could also help each other yeah. by exchanging peer-to-peer, -peer by thinking, and then you come to this community, which is probably not so far away from a model like Facebook. Excellent. Um, let's dream a bit. Of course, um, We want you to be the CEO of AXA for, for several years still, but let's dream. What do you see yourself do if you had to think beyond AXA? To be honest, I, I don't know. I've never planned uh, forward. Uh, Activities uh, more not maybe a company, but you know, do you ah, see yours? Yeah. No, I think what what, it, what is fascinating now is is a couple of things. One is transforming a company mm -hmm. that really excites me, and uh, I, I had the opportunity with my team uh, to really uh, do that, and uh, we've got plenty of plans going forward, so that really excites me, uh, and I want to do that. And secondly, the whole societal engagement and making sure that in public-private partnerships 
leaps. You can achieve things that go beyond your business, but that are inherently connected with your business. And so those are the two areas that uh, I'm very much looking for because at AXA, I mean, I'm only the third CEO in over 30 years. So my predecessor did 17 years, wow. uh, and okay. my okay. pre-predecessor, I think, also around 20 years. Okay. <laughs> so I started with a, a high expectation. All right, all right. But yeah, so continuing the transformation and then see where, where you go from. Yeah, there. and accelerating it, because uh, so far we've done a lot, but uh, the more interesting bits come now. And somebody is picking, precisely picking on this, on this uh, um, aspect and, and, and want to know from you, what are the two most crucial levers for a successful transformation? Number one is being inspired outside. You need to look outside, you need to understand your customer, you need to look what others have done and uh, also in other industries because they've got the same challenge because mm -hmm. change comes from outside, not from inside. When mm -hmm. it comes from inside, it's too late. Mm -hmm. And so that for me is number one, look outside. The other one is uh, manage the transformation in a very uh, collaborative uh, way. So um, this is not happening uh, that you say, look, I want this and this and this done. At the end of the day, a CEO is one wheel in, in a large machine. And um, what is important is that the CEO wheel is the transmission wheel for the others, but you have to motivate the other wheels to also uh, act collectively. And that's why making sure that you have a very collaborative culture, that uh, you listen a lot, that you uh, go a lot um, to the people that know, because at the end of the day, um, the answers are all in-house. You just need to go uh, to the customer front and speak to the people that uh, are working there. They have all the answers. And so, uh, um, you know, understanding this and making sure that they uh, will be heard and that they uh, can also realize their own dreams uh, is extremely important. And for example, when I came into AXA at the very beginning, uh, as a French company, we obviously, uh, as everybody, has a very central uh, governance. Um, I decentralized a lot at the beginning because mm -hmm. I said, look, um, we need to give people uh, power to the people mm -hmm. uh, with, that sit in the countries. Um, a problem solved where it is occurring is always the best place to solve it and not 400 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers, 11,000 kilometers away. Very valuable. Thank you. Um, and do you think that uh, you can still identify some pockets of inertia within AXA throughout this transformation? Or you... All the time. Always, all the time. All the time. And the, the inertia always moves because mm -hmm. uh, when you think you've done, finished the first phase, then comes the second phase, and by definition, everything is inert again. So yes, mm -hmm. uh, it's a constant journey, a constant process, a constant uh, optimization, and you will even find inertia in yourself. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you don't want to question yourself on something you've decided yesterday and, and making sure that you yourself stay agile, you yourself uh, don't become inert is something extremely important. All right. Do you have, um, do you measure, for example, employee engagement or you're not so much in favor of, you, you, you see the engagement, it's translated throughout the, the success of your company? I'm a big fan of it. Uh, we measure it every three months right. and um, what we do as well so we have uh, defined uh, our purposes said earlier. Mm -hmm. We have uh, a clear set of values and we have then translated the values uh, into um, behaviors that we want uh, people to apply. Mm -hmm. And every three months we are measuring uh, these behaviors. Mm -hmm. uh, are they being followed? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. uh, is the purpose, uh, has, have decisions been taken along the purpose? Yes or no? And so, and we do it in a way that is quite uh, uh, open. So, mm -hmm. um, when the uh, the survey starts on a Monday, and the survey finishes on I don't know, Thursday three o'clock, mm -hmm. on Thursday at three ten, this is published to everybody. So mm -hmm. I have no chance to see the numbers beforehand. Um, my colleagues have no chance to see the numbers beforehand because uh, we want this to go out straight away. Okay. Uh, it's the feedback of the people going back to the people. And uh, what was quite interesting, um, we started uh, in 2016 and we do it in ENPS, Employee Net Promoter Score. Mm -hmm. We started in 2016 at minus one. Before the crisis, we were plus 19. The last survey, which I think was in, uh, in the beginning of the year, plus 37. 
So we've doubled uh, our uh, employee satisfaction during the crisis, which is also then an obligation to make the lending point after the crisis now smooth enough that we don't lose on employee engagement. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so the, um, the, the, the behaviors that you ha are describing in your survey, did you, how did you define those, I, I guess? We defined, we defined them with the management committee. So okay. essentially what we did at the very beginning, uh, as well also in 2016 or 17, we, we, we redefined the values. Okay. And the values are not that far away from what we used to have, but we made them extremely precise. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then we saw, for example, one is courage, uh, one is one axa, which means uh, working together. And so then we said, okay, what, how does courage translate um, uh, into uh, daily activity? Mm -hmm. And so, Per value, we have three uh, desired behaviors, and we even rank each other uh, with it. So, for example, with the management committee, once uh, a year, we are being ranked uh, and, and being evaluated by uh, the 50 people below. We call them the partners. Okay. They rank us, uh, and so you see where you are at. And then also you get feedback from your colleague on how he or she perceives you when it comes to this behavior. And um, uh, yeah, I, I know for myself uh, in, in everywhere where I stand, where I need to do more and so on. And so this uh, is extremely useful uh, because the constant feedback creates on the one hand uh, complete transparency around it, mm -hmm. but also a certain competition. So um, when you have, uh, you know, uh, on Thursday afternoon at 15.10, uh, uh, the uh, results that go out, you see, okay, Italy, Germany, US, uh, Thailand, all next to each other. Wh where is the score? How have they moved? Okay. Um, and then also detail. So it's very transparent. Per and country or per, per business? No, per, per country. Per you country. see it per country and okay. uh, you uh, also see then the detail, what has moved. All and right. so um, right. Right. obviously, uh, uh, you know, you want to be uh, making sure that uh, you do a good job. Well, voilà. and it's a healthy competition, I assume, yeah. because yeah. that's what yeah. you <laughs> would like to strive for. All right. Well, we're approaching the, the end of our conversation. I uh, Time flies. Um, I think that um, uh, as the, the last point I would like to ask you is if you could summarize. It's a bit like a classic thing, but three keywords that would describe yourself. Just three. Or three, let's say. Curiosity. Yeah. Reinvention, agility. Awesome. I think we're all inspired. I'm sure we have hundreds of, of students who would like to apply. Happy, <laughs> to happy, that happy to receive all the applications. From all over the world. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. You. Bubel. It was a pleasure having you today. Um, and see you soon for the fourth edition.